Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking you to, to you today uh, about trends in the ongoing digital and green transition. And I shall be looking in particular at whether scientific endeavor is aligning with policies in support of this dual transition, whether they are going in the same direction and with the same enthusiasm. Well, you just got a sneak preview. <laughs> okay, here we go. So there's a lot happening in Southeast Asia. It's of growing geopolitical importance. And we have a very nice uh, illustration of this because only last month, Vietnam and the United States of America signed an agreement to develop the manufacturing of semiconductors in Vietnam. This agreement, now it's particularly interesting because this is not the first time, of course, that a, a wealthy country has wanted to manufacture uh, in a developing country. What is interesting is that this agreement also covers training in electronics and other industry 4.0 fields as well as joint research in areas such as climate science, conservation, biotech, health, and other areas. So these are digital and green areas. Now, uh, if you look at how much Vietnam is spending on R&D at the moment, uh, it's a modest amount, 0.4% of GDP. In recent years, the biggest increase has actually come from Thailand. Uh, a decade ago, Thailand was spending about 0.3% of GDP on research. Look at it now, 1.3%. A decade ago, a decade ago, um, they made the decision to uh, invest heavily in R&D. And what's interesting is that they have also put in place a number of policy instruments. One is this 300% uh, tax rebate on research spending for firms. Uh, there are more startups than there used to be in Thailand, but few of these startups are in uh, high-tech areas. So uh, Malaysia, of course, is the heavyweight in the region. Um, but it has actually axed key research funds in recent years, both for academic research and applied research. But in 2021, it reversed course by creating the great challenge, the grand challenge, which allocates funds to disruptive startups and small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, one thing that is holding Malaysia back is that most research is conducted by universities, but these lack ties to industry. We were doing so well. <laughs> What's happened? Should I press longer? You can just say next, and then they will advance. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> Good old fashioned solution. Thank you. Next, please. So, um, actually, the one before that, the one before that, please, the one before. Yes, thank you. So, uh, now we're going to look briefly at the situation in Vietnam and other ASEAN countries with regard to research on optoelectronics. Uh, you remember that Vietnam has just signed a, an agreement for uh, training in electronics. So you can see that Vietnamese output uh, in this area is modest, even if it is increasing. Uh, when you see an orange bar, that means that in the second four-year period, uh, there was growth. The blue bar refers to the first four-year period. And this is the same. All the graphs cover the same period, so I have not repeated it every time. Uh, when you see um, the paler blue and a pink, 
that means that the output was higher in the first four-year period than in the second four-year period, which is the case here for Singapore and Malaysia. Now, why this drop in Singapore? Uh, well, it can be explained by the fact that the electronics industry is now a lesser priority for Singapore than the biopharmaceutical sector. Now, the important thing to note here is that optoelectronics is a science-based industry and many next generation technologies will come out of the laboratories of universities. It's thus extremely important for there to be ties between the university sector and industry. And we saw that this is lacking still in Malaysia. Next. So uh, in the UNESCO science report, we studied 10 cross cutting fields of scientific publishing that are driving the fourth industrial revolution. And you can see these 10 fields here, they are the 10 circles. Uh, this category is second for volume after health research. This category, uh, these 10 fields accounted between uh, 2015 and 2019 uh, for 18% of scientific output and health research accounted for 33%. So you can see that growth has been strongest in low income and lower middle income countries. And that the greatest output was in artificial intelligence and robotics, energy, then materials science, nanotech, optoelectronics, and pretty modest output in biotech, which is perhaps less of a, a recent, recent area. So I'd like to stress one more time that it is breakthroughs in basic science which are driving uh, next generation technologies in these areas. In other words, most of these strategic technologies that you just saw are science-based. Next. Next, please. Uh, no, you've, I think you've gone too far. No. Ah, right. Okay. You know, you're right. So uh, in this slide, I thought you'd be interested to see how uh, the breakdown in Asian countries. Uh, so three quarters of cross-cutting publications in Asian countries are focusing on AI and robotics, energy and materials science. Uh, AI is in dark blue, energy is in brown, and material science is in red. So th this follows the global trend where you have a, a, a lot of output in these fields. Uh, there is an exception. Uh, Singapore is an exception. They have a, a more even breakdown. And uh, Malaysia and Indonesia are also exceptions because they are concentrating a lot more than three quarters of their scientific output in these three uh, technologies. Next. Thank you. So uh, the fourth industrial revolution is being driven by science-based industries. So it, logically, it's important to have a workforce with skills in both science and engineering. And I don't mean just researchers, but also technicians, uh, science managers. And if you can see from this graph that Asian countries tend to have a high proportion of graduates in engineering, which is good, uh, they also have a relatively high share of graduates in information and communication technologies. The Philippines even has the highest ratio of any Asian country. However, the ratio of science graduates is rather low in most Asian countries. It's the case in the Philippines and, and Vietnam, for instance. Next, please. Now, I wanted to show you this, this graph because uh, people say that the digital and green transitions are linked, uh, that's true, but there are both pluses and, and minuses. And this is actually not from the UNESCO Science Report, it's from a European report that was published last year. Uh, and if uh, you can see the advantages on the left and the disadvantages, the challenges. So, the list of challenges on the right-hand side reads like a to-do list for researchers. 
how can we make digital technologies more efficient? How can we reduce electronic waste? How can we reduce the amount of water used to cool data centers or in microchip manufacturing? What new materials can we develop to reduce demand for minerals used in digital technologies, such as batteries for electric cars or you know, our, our familiar smartphones, which use dozens of, of uh, minerals? Next, please. So this graph, this uh, image, was produced by UNESCO and the European Chemical Society for the International Year of the Periodic Table. It conveys a simple yet chilling message. Half of all the natural elements that exist on our planet could be in short supply within a century or even sooner. Every element that you see here in red, orange, and yellow is at risk. That includes lithium, nickel, cadmium, copper. I just learned that the Philippines has a lot of copper. Uh, these are used in batteries. It includes uranium, which drives nuclear power plants. Uh, you know that many countries are developing new power plants. China, uh, they wanted to develop uh, about 100 power plants, if not more. Uh, but there is a finite amount of uranium. So nuclear power is, is uh, potentially, uh, there's not going to be enough to go around. So you can see from this why it is so important to find new materials, such as novel materials for batteries. Next. So this may be one reason why material science has become such an important field of research. China produces almost four out of every 10 scientific publications on material science. However, this is a priority area for research for Indonesia and Malaysia too, which are in fifth and 10th position worldwide for the share of uh, scientific output in material science. Next, please. However, all Asian countries have seen growth in this field. Uh, if you could just show the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, material science will be vital for the green transition. Uh, there's this nice example of, uh, of scientists at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom who have invented concrete team. Uh, this is concrete that contains graphene. It makes it stronger than standard concrete, meaning that you need less concrete in construction. Uh, so this is a nice example of materials science. Next, please. So how invested are Asian countries in developing more ecological materials for construction? This is also an area that was mentioned by an earlier speaker. Well, the answer is not very. Uh, this is not a pri priority field of research for ASEAN countries. Uh, you can see that the numbers are very, are very small, but you can see that the percentage for Malaysia, even though the overall numbers are small, 449 publications over a four-year period, Malaysia's share of global publications is actually now 3.5%. Uh, so this, uh, this is because Unfortunately, ecological construction materials is not a priority field of research for any country. This field accounted for just 0.1% of, uh, of scientific output over 2011 to 2019. Next, please. So let's take another look at, uh, let's take a look at another research topic, ecological alternatives to plastic. Now, oh, um, could you go back one, please? Thank ah, well, that must be somewhere else in my presentation. Uh, we'll look at ecological alternatives to plastics later. So you're probably wondering, uh, uh, next, please. You're probably one wondering how well Asian countries are doing in research on artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, you were sitting here all asking yourself that question, weren't you? Well, here again, Malaysia and Indonesia figure among the leading countries in terms of volume of output. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, we found the ecological alternative slide. <laughs> right, well, this is going to be a bit of a roller coaster ride. I hope you can follow. Uh, so, uh, 
the, the point of this, uh, there are two messages here. One is that Indonesia has uh, an, increased its output on ecological alternatives to plastics enormously. And if any of you have swum in the sea um, around Bali uh, in recent years, you will know that it is absolutely full of plastic. Yeah. Uh, so their output has gone from six to 155 publications over these two four-year periods. And Thailand is actually publishing nine times the average global proportion. That means that the proportion of articles produced by Thai scientists in this field is nine times the global average proportion. But the overall numbers are very small. 0.03% of, of global output is devoted to de developing new materials, ecological alternatives to plastics. So it's interesting that Indonesia and Thailand are so committed to this issue. Uh, next, please. Okay, <laughs> we're back to artificial intelligence. So um, I just wanted to briefly mention the policies. Uh, Malaysia has adopted a, a roadmap in 2021. Vietnam also has its uh, AI strategy. And Thailand is doing uh, some interesting things. It has set up an Eastern Economic Corridor for Innovation, where research institutes and universities transfer technology to companies. Now, this is high tech in fields such as automation, robotics, and intelligent systems, uh, but also in other industry for fields like biotech. Next, please. So given the fast pace with which digital technologies are developing, small and medium-sized companies are struggling to keep up. The digitalization of existing industries remains a challenge in ASEAN, but let me reassure you, this is also a challenge for the most advanced countries. For example, the European Commission estimates that only about one in five European companies have digitalized their business processes. It has introduced digital innovation hubs to allow companies of all sizes to test before they invest in digital technologies. Australia's own Industry 4.0 strategy proposes establishing test labs at five universities to help manufacturers transition to smart factories that use cyber physical systems like robotics. So here you have some examples of what Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, and Vietnam are doing. Uh, maybe I will not go through it one by one because I imagine that we'll be making this PowerPoint available to you uh, and it's rather long. Uh, so let's move on to smart cities. The next slide. So uh, in Singapore, 80% of housing is public housing. The Housing and Development Board is equipping homes and the city with sensors and other technology to provide efficient services and reduce waste. Uh, for example, it is developing smart buses uh, in partnership with a private company. The city is also developing smart wastewater treatment. Uh, you'll be familiar, no doubt, with the new Clark City, which is uh, developing driverless public transport, also an efficient wastewater system. This was mentioned, uh, the importance of uh, wastewater treatment and recycling and reuse. Uh, and it's being built inland uh, to uh, withstand flooding with wide drainage and no build zones. Very important um, to have that. And then Thailand, now they're taking a bit of a different approach. They're, they're uh, investing in smart innovation districts. Uh, the National Innovation Agency provides funds to allow startups to test their unproven ideas, technology, uh, to see which suit local needs. So that, that's an interesting example. And you can see that uh, universities, local experts, et cetera, are being brought in. Now, uh, Let's take a look at the situation with regard to publishing on wastewater uh, treatment. Let's see uh, if research is keeping pace with policy. Next slide, please. So you see the numbers are pretty low, uh, but because the global trend is also fairly low, 0.24% of all publications, uh, Malaysia's share is still 2.7% of the output. And the countries tend to follow more or less the same order, you'll have noticed, uh, for, for each of these topics. Um, sometimes Singapore is, is, is uh, first or second. 
So now uh, I'd like to move to the European Union just to talk about some of the strategies that they're adopting. Next slide, please. So uh, now there are two striking things from this list of the industrial priorities of the European Union, China, and the USA. One is the similarity between the industrial priorities of the European Union and the USA. The second is the extent to which these industrial priorities are science-based. Next slide, please. So uh, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later during the open forum, because the European Union is really doing some interesting things. Uh, the European Green Deal to 2027 includes an industrial strategy. Uh, they have created a fund. Now, for the moment, it's very reliant on input from the private sector. So they have not yet got this one trillion euros that they're aiming for. But the idea is to have a just transition me mechanism uh, a fund which will cushion job losses from phasing out polluting industries to limit turbulence in vulnerable countries. And you talked earlier about the importance of social justice. So this is a very important element for social justice. Uh, and then there is also uh, re a research and innovation uh, aspect, uh, regions, not every region should specialize in everything because obviously they don't have the means and, and it doesn't make economic sense. So uh, the European Union is encouraging regions within countries to specialize in one particular area, uh, such as wind turbines, uh, and uh, to develop expertise in that area. And the idea is to have a map of Europe where you have different regions that are specializing in different technologies rather than competing with one another. And then you have mission-oriented policies. Uh, one mission is to have 100 climate smart cities by 2050. And the idea is to bring in industry, universities, um, civil society, et cetera, to achieve together this, uh, these climate smart cities. Next slide, please. And there is a, an external reason for ASEAN countries to decarbonize their exports. And that is because the EU has adopted a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, well, it becomes operational next month. And the idea is twofold. It's to buffer European companies that commit to decarbonization from unfair foreign competition and to make carbon rich imports uh, pay higher customs duties and tariffs uh, this will concern imports of cement, iron and steel, aluminium. You can see the list, quite a long list. Um, and if ASEAN countries don't decarbonize their exports to the EU, they may pay higher customs duties and tariffs in the future. So, so that's another incentive. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, these are some, some examples. Uh, maybe I'll just talk about them very briefly. In Sri Lanka, uh, this again is an inclusive transition. Uh, this is in households um, which, who buy uh, small rooftop solar plants for individual use. Uh, they can sell their surplus electricity to the national grid or they can bank it for later use. In Cambodia, um, I mentioned this because Cambodia has realized that sustainable development has to be consistent across sectors. and uh, although hydropower is considered a renewable energy, it was devastating fish stocks in Cambodia. And so they have called a moratorium uh, until 2030. And they've also adopted a code, uh, Environment and Natural Resources Code, to protect the environment. The, it was just adopted very recently. And in India, uh, they're going the way of uh, uh, one of their priorities is to encourage the purchase of electric and hybrid vehicles, most of which are two wheelers at the moment. Uh, also buses, and so they're providing 12 to 14 percent reduction in goods and services tax on electric vehicles, a tax deduction also on the interest paid on loans to buy, buy these vehicles. So now I'd like to look at uh, the research topic, next slide please, of climate-ready crops because you'll see here that the Philippines leads the Asian uh, region 
for publications on climate ready crops. Again, it's a, a bit of an orphan topic, 0.02% of uh, global publications. And the uh, Philippines doubled its output on climate ready crops over these two periods. Next, please. So uh, if you're if you'll buy, bear with me for one minute, maybe I'll show you just one more slide. Probably after that, you'll have had enough. Uh, I just wanted to show you that uh, the share of output on sustainable energy research topics by higher income countries is shrinking. Uh, the blue line refers to high income countries' share of these research topics in 2011, and the orange line refers to the high income countries share in 2019. You can see it's shrinking for all of these topics here. And for photovoltaics, it's even shrunk from 75% to 50%. So there's uh, a lot more uh, happening here. So maybe I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time and your attention.